In our last video, we used destination net to achieve reachability between server 30 and server 60, where we have uh, an IP address conflict with our 172.168.30 subnets, which happen to exist on both sides. But in this video, I went ahead and removed all the virtual IP config and the inbound security policy that references that virtual IP objects. And the reason for that is we're going to use the longest prefix match in this lab to achieve reachability between the two servers. Essentially, we're going to rely on the fundamentals of IP routing to make this possible. To better understand how this works, let's look at the route table on the 48. Starting from the side A firewall, And because our environment is small, we only have four entries in our route table. And explaining this from the bottom up, we can see 192.168.4, which happens to be the management interface. This is how I'm connected to the 48 um, to manage it. Um, this one is 4.111. Then we have two networks that are directly attached as well. The 172.168.30, which is what we're going to be working on in this lab as well as the 10.160.10, which is the internet-facing um, subnet. The IPv4 notation uses 32 bits to express a network, and these three networks use 24 bits to express um, each of these three networks. So the default static route is different, in a sense that it uses zero bits to define a network to anything, to any way. So what this means is that if your route lookup happens on, on, on the firewall locally and you've got multiple route entries, but your intended destination does not match any of the entries you have in your route table, it will be forwarded out to the next hop IP that is defined here, the default static route. This is how the default routing works, the gateway of last resort. So our gateway of last resort is 10.160.10.1, and we know that to be the ISP. And the same would be true in site B. Let's pull that up and look at our route table. We have our management interface. We have our local LAN subnet as well as the internet um, link and the default static route. So currently, we don't have reachability from server 30 to, to server 60, and let's validate that. So server 30, let's validate our IP address. 172.168.30.30, that's server 30. Server 60. Server 60 is 172.168.30.60. And just for giggles, let's try to ping 172.16.30.30 and we don't have reachability which is expected so now let's go back to the firewalls the principle of longest prefix match in our context means we are trying to reach a host in the 172.16.30 network and we already have that it's directly connected but if we were to create an additional route entry using anything longer than 24 and in this case i want to create an entry using all 32 bits to be as specific as possible, just a host address, that entry I expect would be inserted in the route table. We're going to do that both on site A and site B. I'll start with um, site A. We're going to forward that traffic to 10.160.10.1, which is our next hop, or rather the gateway of last resort. And from the perspective of site B, our route entry is going to be 172.16.30.30. This is our intended destination. And to reach that destination, we're going to forward the traffic to 10.180.10.1, which is the ISP on interface Ethernet E03. So our new route is defined, but I want to go back to the route table. As we expected, we can see that the additional static route is now inserted in the route table. That would hold true for site B as well. Again, just as we expected, 172.160.30.30 is now an entry in the route table and it's no longer confined to port 3. It's going to be forwarded out to this next hop address, 
which is our ISP via port 2. So this looks good. This is what we expect so far. Let's have a look at our topology. Our static routes are defined from side A and side B. Now we have to transit the ISP environment from side B to reach that network, the dot 30 and in the reverse direction as well. But what does the ISP know about these two networks, these two destinations that we're trying to get to? Because if we don't have a path on the ISP side, it means that the end-to-end -end transport is not in place and the routing would not work. Now let's have a look at the ISP environment. Show IP route. And here I don't see any references to the 172.16 network. So we'll have to create those static routes. The first one would say, to reach 172.160.30, we need to forward the traffic to 10.160.10.254. And to reach 172.160.30.60, we need to forward the traffic to 10.180.10.254. Now let's get that going. 172.16.30.30. And the subnet mask is going to be 255, 255, 255. 255 and the next hop for this one is going to be 10.160.10.254 the next hop for this one is going to be 10.180.10.254 now our two static routes are in place we're happy with that now we have our routes on the 40 gates as well as the ISP environment, I believe we have end-to-end -end reachability. The last thing that we want to do is create security policy allowing for the inbound traffic um, from the perspective of each of the firewalls, starting with site A. So on site A, we go to policy and objects and create the inbound security policy. The destination I want to be explicit about the destination. So our destination is server 30 and I want to create an address object and reference that with our security policy. And I'll just name that SRV 30. And the address is 172.16.30.30 using slash 32 prefix. I'm going to allow all services to this destination. And we disable net, that's for sure. Now our policy in place, let's go to site B and do exactly the same thing. We go to policy and objects, firewall policy. This too, I'm just going to call inbound. And again here, the destination, I'll have to create an, ad an address object. This would be server 60 with the address 172.16.30.60 slash 32. Again, here I'm going to allow all services and disable net. Now to recap, we have static route on the firewall, we have static route on the router, and I believe we have end-to-end -end reachability. So now let's go to our hosts. Now we're back on server 30. Let's do reachability test to server 60. And that doesn't seem to be working. Destination host unreachable. And we can't reach server 30 from server 60 either. Let's have a look at the firewalls and try to see what's going on. I'm going to start with 40 gate uh, site B and do um, sniffer packet and see what's going on under the hood. I want to see all the traffic that is being sent to 30.30 .30 from side B. Now, we're not seeing anything when our packet capture is using a filter for the, the destination, which is 172.16.30.30. I'm going to change this to the source instead. Now, we're looking for traffic coming from 172.16.30.60, which is a source local to site B. And I'm not seeing any ICMP traffic. Is the ICMP traffic from the ICMP traffic is ongoing on on server 60. So this tells me that the server is actually not forwarding traffic to the firewall. 
because there's no traffic coming in at all. And the simple reason for that, 172.168.30 is an IP address that is local and there's no reason for server 60 to craft a packet that is um, going to be forward to, to, um, forwarded to the default gateway because it doesn't need the default gateway to handle that traffic because the traffic is uh, within the local subnet. And instead, it's doing um, local ARP quest trying to resolve the IP address associated with 172.168.30 locally on the segment. So what we have to do in this particular case is we have to go back to server 60 and server 30 and to create a static route um, for the destination. The easiest way is to go to the network wired settings and IPv4. I'm going to put this off and create a static route 172.16.30.30. It will use a prefix length of 32 bits and we want to forward this traffic to our default gateway 172.16.30.254. I'm just going to bounce the interface and then let's see if this has had any help. And immediately it begins to work. Let's have a look at server 30. Server 30 is still unable to reach, um, um, initiate outgoing traffic to server 60. Let's do the same. We go down to routes. And our route entry is 172.16.50.60. Let's bounce the interface as well. And let's run our ping again. And this time around, as expected, our ping starts working. This brings us to the end of this lab. Thank you for watching. Until the next one.